around the pit butt. For as long as I can remember, I have always loved robots, from Voltus 5 to Grandizer to R2-D2 and C-3PO. Okay, well, maybe not C-3PO. And even long before that, I was a huge fan of those terrible lizards, better known as dinosaurs. I mean, what kid wasn't, am I right? Anyways, given these two primal loves of mine as a kid, you can imagine the surge of excitement that I felt when I first saw this image on a catalog that came with one of my Diaclone robots that my dad had brought home for me from Japan. I couldn't read Japanese of course, but that didn't matter. Robots that turned into dinosaurs? I was instantly sold. Figuratively that is. Of course, being a child, I had no means of actually flying off to the land of the rising sun to get myself these sweet dino robos. It would be a few years later when I would finally get my hands on one of these dudes. During a trip to the US on a grocery run of all places with my mom, there they were. All five dinosaur robots, now under their collective American name of the Dinobots, all present at the end of the checkout counter. Given that the three-horned dinosaur Triceratops was my favorite dinosaur of all time, it was the Dinobot slag that I ended up taking home that day. And that was pretty much it. I don't know what it was, but I never really felt the need to badger my parents into getting me the rest of the Dinobots, which in retrospect was probably what I should have done since, as it turned out, I didn't end up with the best one of the bunch. As a huge Triceratops fan, it wasn't much of a surprise that I didn't really care much for his arguably more popular rival, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Tyrant King if you will. Back in the 80s, before we knew about other meat eaters like the Giganotosaurus or Spinosaurus, the T-Rex was it, the most dangerous dinosaur, nay, predator to ever walk the earth. And aside from a few horny fans like myself, the most popular dinosaur of all time, which is probably why that when it came to the Dinobots, it was the T-Rex robot that stood apart from the rest in almost every possible way. First up was his newly minted name. Unlike the rest of the Dinobots who sported rather unimaginative one-syllable names that all started with S, Slag, Swoop, Snarl, and Sludge, the T-Rex got the two-syllable name of Grimlock, which didn't make that much sense back then other than it sounded pretty badass. And then there was the toy itself. I eventually got my hands on the Grimlock toy several months later when my friend brought his toy to school one day. And even back then, I could tell that this guy outclassed my slag in almost every single way. Even if I didn't know the meaning of the word proportional back then, that's what he was. Let's call it a very aesthetically pleasing toy. He was also visually different with his wide and shiny gold chest topped off with a mysterious and intimidating masked head and visor. And then there was his dino mode which literally stood taller than the rest of his four-legged cohorts. Despite not being a big fan of the T-Rex in general, even I couldn't deny that this was a fun toy with his super poseable appendages and huge chompers. So yeah, even I had to admit that Grimlock was king. Anyway, as a character, for better or worse, Grimlock has also received the most focus and development over the rest of his Dinobot crew. In the original cartoon, they all seem to start off on fairly equal footing, having been constructed by the Autobots Ratchet and Wheeljack in order to beef up the Autobot forces. Grimlock, along with Slag and Sludge, were the first Dinobots to be made. Let's call them Phase 1. And taking a cue from the general perception of dinosaurs at the time, they were all rather one-note personality types with Slag being hostile, Grimlock arrogant, and Sludge stupid, to put it bluntly. And they all spoke with rather cliché, simplistic, brutish, and caveman-like speech patterns and often referred to themselves in the third person, case in point, the now iconic phrase, ME GRIMLOCK! From the start, Grimlock had a problem with the Autobot leader Optimus Prime, in that seeing himself to be the more powerful individual, Grimlock couldn't quite accept what he perceived as the weaker Prime as his leader, which was something that Megatron ended up exploiting, convincing Grimlock, along with Slag and Sludge, to go against Prime. This turn of events prompted the Autobots to build more Dinobots, Phase 2, with Snarl and Swoop in order to battle Grimlock and company. In the end, Prime ends up saving Grimlock from an exploding meteorite and ultimately wins over the Dinobot leader's trust, loyalty, and most importantly, respect. Unfortunately, despite how cool the Dinobots were as a team and concept, they were not immune to the passage of time and the need for Hasbro to keep feeding the fandom with newer and shinier characters and toys. And so by the third season of the cartoon, only Grimlock was a regular reoccurring character in the series. 
but no longer was he the arrogant and dangerous Autobot. He had been inexplicably reduced to a comedic simpleton bordering on childish character who while capable of still kicking butt from time to time, would rather cuddle up and listen to stories about petro rabbits from the Autobot veteran Cup. There was one memorable episode though wherein Grimlock was bestowed with advanced intelligence allowing him to create the futuristic Autobot team, the Technobots, and gave them the ability to combine into Computron. In the end, however, in order to give his creation a leg up on their more bestial rivals, the Terrorcons, and their combined form, Abominus, Grimlock transferred his newly gained intelligence to Computron, thus returning to his original simpler Petro-Rabbit-loving and fishing enthusiast state. Fortunately though, it's in the comics that Grimlock truly gets to shine. In the original Marvel Comics run, Grimlock is a more nuanced character, not perfect by any means, but not the slow and brutish character that he was portrayed as in the cartoon. In fact, his caveman speech pattern that he was known for was actually a deliberate act by Grimlock in the comics. Since he openly regarded intellectuals as weak, he didn't want to be perceived as one himself. Plus, sounding slow and stupid only worked to his advantage, leading many enemies to underestimate him. Anyway, in the Marvel comics, Grimlock and company are part of the original ARC crew that crashes on Earth. They are revived in a prehistoric Earth by Teletran 1 millions of years before the rest of the Autobots in order to take out the Decepticon Shockwave, which, after an epic battle, ends with all combatants getting trapped in a massive tar pit until they are later revived in modern times. Once reactivated upon learning of the apparent death of Optimus Prime, Grimlock immediately barges into the Ark talks trash about Prime's stinky leadership style, and demands to be the new leader of the Autobots. As you can imagine, this doesn't quite go over so well with the Autobots, who quickly reject his oh-so-generous offer. Fortunately for Grimlock, the Autobots are then attacked by the giant Decepticon Trypticon, and while the rest of the Dinobots remain content to sit back and watch the Autobots fend for themselves, Grimlock isn't. The Dinobot leader charges into battle to fight Trypticon and with the help of his crew who will eventually follow suit as well. He is able to defeat the giant Decepticon. Okay, they actually cause him to use up his fuel supplies and so Trypticon has no choice but to retreat. Anyway, thanks to his courageous act of saving the Autobots, Grimlock is finally accepted as their new leader. But the honeymoon period of his leadership is short-lived as almost immediately he is corrupted by his newfound unlimited power as he prioritizes fashioning a literal crown for his head as well as building a variable voltage harness to torture any Autobot defectors to his rule. Eventually though, Prime does return as a power master and takes back his rightful place as the Autobot leader. Grimlock, however, remains as one of his trusted lieutenants. See, for all his faults and his reliance on power and disdain for weakness, Grimlock had a pretty sound moral core which drove him to hate even more those who used their power to abuse those who were weak. And so at the end of the day, he always ended up championing the Autobot cause and had a deep respect for Prime and would fall under his leadership willingly. But he did hate Prowl. Man, did he hate Prowl. Years later though, it would be the company IDW that would take Grimlock's character into more interesting and unexplored territories. As expected, way before ending up on Earth, Grimlock was already known as a formidable warrior who had a penchant of working outside the system, often disobeying his superiors. And it was because of this that he usually found himself in the military brig, and it was there where he met the equally abrasive detainee, Slag. Grimlock and Slag spent most of their time in prison swapping stories and trying to one-up each other on who was the more despicable. An argument Slag ended up winning. Despite this, they both took a liking to each other and formulated plans to assemble a kick-ass, rule-breaking strike force, and thus the Dinobots, with a Y, were born. I know it's such a little thing, but I like this subtle switch since having them called Dinobots with an eye while on Cybertron where dinosaurs didn't exist wouldn't have made sense. On a quick side note, I'd like to give recognition where it's due. It was a few years earlier where the previous comic license holder Dreamwave actually came up with the name Dinobots, along with some awesome pre-dinosaur designs by the very talented Filipino artist Don Figueroa. I loved his original designs so much that I actually recreated them in 3D and animated them to transform. These cool designs were immortalized in plastic toy form by the third-party company Iron Factory. Anyway, back to IDW. After carrying out over 200 successful missions and receiving numerous commendations, Grimlock's crew undertook a mission that would forever change them, for the worst. 
While investigating a network of tunnels underneath the Taraxis plains, the Dinobots encounter a horde of powerful cybermorphic predators. Desperate and outnumbered, the Dinobots resorted to an untested technology called Dynamic Alt Mode Adaptation that was being worked on by one of their members, Scar, which was to scan the creatures and adopt their forms and match their power. And ultimately, because of this, they managed to survive. Well, most of them, that is. In case you're wondering why the Dinobot Scar doesn't sound very familiar, well, that's because he didn't make it. But he didn't fall prey to their enemies. Instead, he was inadvertently killed by Grimlock, who was unfortunately unable to control his brand new rage induced by his monstrous form. After this series of unfortunate events, Grimlock and the surviving Dinobots were never the same and turned to the illegal gladiatorial pits where they were nearly recruited into the rising Decepticon group being assembled by Megatron. Ultimately though, when war finally did break out, Grimlock and company joined the side of the Autobots. And it was in this great war that they would often butt heads with the Decepticon one-eyed mad scientist, Shockwave. The Dinobots hated Shockwave due to the fact that the Decepticon had blown up a massive Energon cache that the Dinobots had been hoarding. And so, when the opportunity came for them to extract their revenge by tracking down the Decepticon to a prehistoric Earth against the orders of Optimus Prime, they took it. Shockwave had traveled to Earth in order to stabilize Ultra Energon deposits he had previously planted there. Grimlock and company eventually caught up with him and then proceeded to attack. Prior to the battle though, in order to protect themselves from the high Energon levels on the Earth that would send them into instant stasis lock, the Dinobots reformatted their bodies into the forms of dinosaurs based on fossilized remains that they scanned underneath the surface. They also encased their bodies in synthetic flesh for protection. Anyway, in the ensuing battle, Shockwave manages to blast away the Dinobots' protective flesh, causing them to all go into stasis lock, which would have spelled out a victory for Shockwave. However, unbeknownst to him and the rest of the Dinobots, Grimlock had secretly activated a dead man switch on their ship, designated to take out Shockwave if they were defeated. The switch was activated when Grimlock and company went into stasis lock and thus the ship fired upon a dormant volcano, causing it to erupt and just like the original Marvel run, buried Shockwave and the Dinobots for millions of years. And just like in the original Marvel comics, they were all revived in modern times. And this is where things turn rather grim for Mr. Locke. But before we get to all of that, I'd like to give you all a not so grim reminder to help me out by liking and subscribing to my channel. I mean, if you are locked in and all, it shouldn't be much to ask, right? If you already have, then thank you. So back to the story. So as would be expected, the rest of the Dinobots didn't quite appreciate being placed into stasis lock and getting buried under volcanic rock for millions of years. And they blamed all of this on Grimlock and his insatiable need for revenge which they felt superseded his concern over the welfare of the team. Fair assessment on their part if you ask me. And so they broke up the band with Grimlock basically going his own way. Eventually Grimlock was taken prisoner by Scorponok who was working for an enigmatic being called the Grand Architect who required an ancient artifact called the Magnificence that was, in a grim turn of events, locked inside the Dinobot's chest. See what I did there? Anyway, unable to pry the Magnificence free from his chest, Grimlock was subjected to endless mental and physical torture until the Dinobot lost control of his body and involuntarily relinquished the artifact. While he survived, the experience left Grimlock with immense mental and physical trauma and severe brain damage, reducing him into a primitive non-speaking state. Now deemed useless, he was placed in a stasis tube that was eventually lost when the ship transporting it to another facility crashed on the planet Clemency, only to be finally recovered by a mismatched group of Decepticons appropriately known as the Scavengers. By this time, the Great War was mostly over and this group of Decepticons, which included their leader Croc, along with Crankcase, Misfire, Flywheels, and Spinister, figured that they could use the recovered Grimlock as a bargaining chip to improve their status on Cybertron with the Autobots, whom they believed won the war. But over time, the Scavengers, particularly Misfire, took a genuine liking to Grimlock and took it upon themselves to rehabilitate the mentally damaged Dinobot. And that's pretty much where Grimlock's IDW story ended. Granted that these are very broad strokes, and I did gloss over a lot of details, including Grimlock eventually ripping the Scavengers to pieces. But I'll just leave that for all of you to go through, as you wish. Well, I would say that the Scavengers were a massive downgrade from the Dinobots. It was a noise story arc nonetheless, showing how Grimlock, the once powerful warrior, 
found a new home with a bunch of ragtag Decepticons, and how together they worked at having the Dinobot regain his lost faculties. Aww. Anyway, now that we got the main Grimlock story out of the way, given its overall popularity, let's do a quick rundown at some better known or in some cases lesser known iterations of the character and whatever little knowledge I may or may not have on them. First up, Beast Wars Grimlock. While many familiar G1 names were used for completely new characters in this series, mostly for the sake of retaining their trademarks, the Beast Wars Grimlock was actually the original G1 Grimlock, no longer a fearsome T-Rex. Grimlock was forced to undergo maximal downsizing, and the result? A repaint of the maximal Velociraptor Dinobot. What I would call a T-Rex to a Velociraptor a notable downgrade, I do think his new black and white deco does look quite striking. The only reason I got a toy of this repaint though, was because he came packaged with an Earthrise version of the Autobot Mirage, which I wanted. So good on you Hasbro. Next up, Alternators, or Binotech if you're a fan of Diecast, Grimlock. Now this was a major departure for the character as he was no longer a dinosaur but an officially licensed Ford Mustang, which to be fair, if he had to be a car, was most likely the best fitting choice. Then we got the classics Grimlock whose claim to fame was that he had a very unique transformation from splitting the Tyrannosaurus head in half to form the feet, rotating the front chest plate and the mirror hinged shoulders. This guy's engineering was insane. Sure you had a parts forming tail but whatever. I would say that the only real knock against this guy was that he was tiny. Okay, maybe not tiny, but definitely too small for what he was supposed to be. And speaking of too small, I give you MP08 Masterpiece Grimlock. Okay, so to be fair again, at the time of its release in 2008, the whole Masterpiece line was treated more as a series of epic one-off releases, not intended to be an all-encompassing line. And so while this Grimlock was very noticeably smaller than the MP01 Optimus Prime, it didn't really matter. Until it did. Fast forward a few years later and the Masterpiece line was a line where scale did matter. So I did what any self-respecting scale-obsessed collector would do. Buy the oversized knockoff version that is. And so I present to you Reximus Prime. Every bit the original Masterpiece Grimlock. Just bigger. Eventually though, I would settle on a more original masterpiece version of Grimlock in the form of the third-party company, Giga Powers Super Raider. Yup, I was a little late into the game when it came to collecting masterpiece Dinobots, and as such, the Iron Diebots from my usual go-to company, Fans Toys, had gotten way too expensive for my budget. So I had to settle for a masterpiece set from another company, Giga Power. Although, Settle is probably a poor choice of words as I really love this more toy accurate set of Dinobots who amusingly reversed the official naming structure of the four S's Slag, Swoop, Snarl, and Sludge and one G for Grimlock to four G's Grassor, Gaudenter, Gutter, Graviter, and an S for Superator. I don't know, I just thought it was a nice twist. Anyway, I jumped over to Masterpiece Toys a little too soon. I've actually got a few more mainline Grimlocks that I'd like to cover. First up would be the Power of the Primes Grimlock. An interesting case as at face value, this is a fairly decent version. He may be a little undersized but his real crime is that his final look is compromised by his intended gimmick which was to be the central piece of the Dinobot combiner Volcanicus. So yeah, he's unique in that way and the set with his fellow sorely undersized Dinobots would have been acceptable if the end combined result of Volcanicus was cool. Sadly, it wasn't, and I had to rely on some third-party add-on kits to make this dude even halfway decent. Fortunately though, we wouldn't have to wait long for a mainline and appropriately sized leader class Grimlock from the Studio Series 86 line. There really isn't much to complain about this guy as he is like the perfect modern update of the original vintage toy. And speaking of the original toy, taking a cue from the wildly awesome Missing Link Optimus Prime, i.e. Takara's faithfully reconstructed vintage Optimus Prime with more articulation. It seems like the third-party Missing Link version of Grimlock from the company Bingo Toys, called Grimsharp, is also on the way sometime next year. And barring some possible legal action from Takara, this is one Grimlock that I am eagerly awaiting. But guess what? We are so not done yet. There's Transformers Animated Grimlock, who started as an animatronic dinosaur brought to life by an Allspark key. This Grimlock was accompanied by his fellow Dinobots Swoop and Sla- I mean Snarl, and of the three was the only one who actually spoke. In line with the series' very quirky aesthetic of many characters having oversized chins, this Grimlock had a comically massive underbite. Next up, Robots in Disguise Grimlock, who had a very distinct green look. 
And while I never really watched this show, I did find out that his inclusion in the series wasn't the original plan. The original plan was to include a new Dinobot character that would transform into a red Stegosaurus. Snarl, is that you? But that plan was changed at Hasbro's request in order to capitalize on Grimlock's 2014 live-action debut, the fourth Transformers movie, Age of Extinction. And so, Green Grimlock was born. And speaking about the live-action movie, Grimlock and the Dinobots, as if the title didn't give it away, were heavily advertised as the main draw of this fourth movie. Well, that and the grand debut of Mark Wahlberg as the new human star. As it turned out, this movie should have just been called The Age of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, as Grimlock and company basically show up at the very, very, very last part of the movie. And granted their scene was pretty cool, all five minutes of it or so, there really wasn't much personality or character to talk about. Oh, and despite being inexplicably called ancient knights, they were basically portrayed as mindless beasts of destruction. I'm pretty sure that the thought process behind their inclusion was Michael Bay in the writer's room just saying, Hey dudes, wouldn't it be cool for Optimus Prime to ride on a T-Rex? And that was it. No need for any proper explanation as to how. The Dinobots just showed up out of nowhere, Prime clobbered Grimlock, and all of a sudden, he became the Autobot leader's steed. Anyway, another amusing thing about these Dinobots was that despite being basically dull gray in color, their toys came in all bright colors of the rainbow, just like a bag of nips which I found rather odd but strangely cool at the same time. At least it made for a more interesting display. Unfortunately, Grimlock was the worst of the bunch. For a supposedly ancient and powerful warrior, this toy was very unimposing and skinny. And his dino mode was laughable at best. Fortunately, this was fixed in the later Studio Series line wherein a new Grimlock was released, which was a huge improvement. But not huge enough for me as I opted for the oversized KO version of this guy. But as great as he looked in both modes, his overall grim gray design just didn't keep me locked in. It was just blah for me, so I sold him off eventually. A pretty grim ending for this toy if you ask me. I don't know, while I'm generally a fan of the Bayverse designs as a whole, this Grimlock just ultimately didn't do it for me. But let me tell you about some Bayverse designs that I did love. You can check them out over here and over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.